Hey everyone, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Executive Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is fingernails grow three to four times faster than your toenails. The nails on your dominant hand grow faster than the ones on your less dominant hand. And the longer your fingers are, the faster they grow. And apparently in summer, your nails grow faster than they do in winter. So there must be ways to biohack your fingernails, but I have yet to figure those out. <laughs> Today's guest on the show is Pedram Shojai. Pedram's going to talk about his new movie called Vitality, and Pedram is well known, so to speak, for a website called Well.org, which he founded. Well.org covers health news, nutrition stories, fitness, medicine, green issues, and even philanthropy. And it covers something called symbiotic capitalism, which is a new model of capitalism where we look at how do we make a business that supports life all around us. And that's really the reason Pedram and I have gotten to be friends. Also, I had to meet Pedram after I read his first book called Rise and Shine, Awaken Your Body or Awaken Your Energy Body with Taoist Alchemy and Qigong. So Pedram's led like the craziest life ever. He's like been a monk. Um, he's levitated. Okay, maybe not. But uh, this guy knows what he's talking about. Pedram, welcome to the show, man. Dave, great to be here. So, all right, one of the things that made me want to talk with you is you studied biology at UCLA, and then you had all these profound mystical experiences, wrote a book about it, learned about Eastern arts, and you have a master's in Oriental medicine now? Yeah. And you've done like Kung Fu, Tai Chi, Qigong, yoga, meditation. How did you go from being a biology dude to being like Mr. Meditation and Mr. Wellness and Mr. Capitalism? Like you've, you've got a lot going on. <laughs> Great question. Um, you know, I started as a biology dude because, you know, it makes sense. You want to help people, you're, you're studying science, you're going. And then what happened was I was actually blessed in a way by meeting uh, some really miserable people when I was at UCLA uh, in the med medical department. And, you know, I just looked down the barrel of uh, my future and said, man, I don't want this guy's life. This sucks. You know, they were just <laughs> not really helping people. This, the, the particular individuals that I'm, I was looking to model, they weren't really helping people and they were just kind of stuck and you know well this is how we've always done it and this is what we do and I was like you know you know I grew up in the generation where we all wanted to be Jedis <laughs> and I said well you know at the time I was taking some uh, Tai Chi and uh, just got more and more into the stuff and uh, met a Taoist master um, of Kung Fu and then suddenly you know became a Taoist monk and started studying uh, under uh, a series of Qigong masters I started studying uh, I studied with the Dalai Lama I got to travel and study with a lot of um, internal consciousness cats and how, then it, how does one suddenly become a Taoist monk it, it, it seems like kind of an unusual <laughs> sudden change I, I mean I, it was it was a mail order thing you know <laughs> Taoistmonk.com yeah I've been there yeah totally well it's, it's more of a dot org but yeah <laughs> Yeah, you know, I met this Kung Fu master and, you know, the more I started studying with him, the more he was like, uh, like, hey, man, you know, you're you're really into this stuff. You really get it here. How about this book? How about this? You know, how about these other things? And, you know, as I started kind of going down the road, he had taken a series of his black belts and was going to do kind of a, a intense. He was an abbot from a, a Taoist lineage. And, you know, the old man came from China. He's kind of one of the most reputable guys. He's now passed, but one of the most reputable guys uh, that came over that isn't playing like China, Disneyland, spirituality, you know, just the BS that you get when like you go to like some of these temples in China and they're all just faking it because they want your tourist dollars. So he was, you know, a leg legitimate guy who didn't get executed type of thing, came over here and taught, you know, opened his hand and taught uh, my teacher. And then I ended up studying with, with him as well. And then, you know, it took, you know, about a couple years before I devoted to becoming a monk and, uh, you know, studied uh, pretty intensely with that guy. I still study with him. It's just, it's, it's a way of life, right? I'll, no, I'll never not be a student of Tao because to me, it's just the coolest thing ever. So you've also studied medicine though. How do you keep the science and the mysticism separate? You know, that's a great question. And I, I really don't in some ways because I've always been a scientist. So, you know, when I first was, uh, you know, approached by an acupuncturist in my Kung Fu tradition and he's like, hey, you know, I, I, saw, I saw you hurt your arm. Let me help you out with something. And he, you know, hits some points and all of a sudden my fingers are working again and everything's working fine. You know, I scratch my head and say, ooh, interesting. 
right? And no, no, so, you're supposed to say acupuncture doesn't work, therefore my fingers don't feel better. Come on. That's right. Or or I don't believe in <laughs> I don't believe in that, which is one of my favorite scientific yeah. subjects, right? Yeah. And, and these guys, you know, it's just they get into this dogma and they can't get out of it. And for me, as a true scientist, I was like, holy shit, that worked. Now what? Right. And so I started observing with uh, this guy. And, you know, within the course of a very uh, short amount of time, I couldn't explain what it was that I had witnessed, but I couldn't deny the fact that I had witnessed it. And a good scientist doesn't throw out data that doesn't fit their belief system. That's that whole it, why question that, that forms a hypothesis, right? Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. So good science says, okay, well, this warrants an investigation. And that investigation led me through the Himalayas and the Andes and, you know, everywhere else I've gone in my life because it's like, holy crap, there's something here and I got to know about it. So, you know, I don't think I've ever let go of my scientific mind. I just didn't close it off to dogma. Uh, we we share that in common. I, I've spent time in the Andes and Himalayas as well, and at Buddhist monasteries. And it, same thing. It's a quest for understanding is scientific, and acknowledging a phenomena that you can't understand is at the core of the advancement of science. And the fact that there isn't a double-blind study about a phenomena you observed doesn't mean that the phenomena didn't happen. It just means that someone ought to do a double-blind study. Except, well, maybe we'll never pay for it. Uh, but we can still say with relative certainty that the sky is a certain color, even if we never actually double blind studied that because enough people saw it. Well, okay. that's sacrilegious, David. I don't even I don't even know where you're coming from with that. <laughs> <laughs> Fair point. I, I I see a lot of this in nutrition right now, and I'm sure you do too. You know, there, there's sites that that will like use uh, epidemiology study to you know quote take down uh, paleo or vegan diets or you know, insert name of some other diet here. Uh, but then I'm like, but the people who do whatever that is, they got something out of it, even the vegans. Like, there's no question in my mind that when I went to be a raw vegan, I did lose weight and I felt great. And there's also no question that later there were there was a downside to it. But, you know, to to deny that stuff in favor of like these large population studies like NHANES always seemed crazy. So and here you are, your guy, Taoist and Shaolin and doctor. So, I don't know, all right, let's just cut right to it. Like, what, what's your take on what people ought to be eating? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a big fan of the wild stuff, right? If, if nature made it, um, it's probably pretty cool. And um, if it's been processed, um, you know, just go walk through the stores that serve the most processed food. Go through Walmart, look down the aisles, and you'll have a pretty good idea what that food's going to do to you. And so for me, you know, mostly vegetarian diet with lots of na natural healthy fats and, and animals that you would want to emulate. I mean, you know, think about a chicken that's been farm raised. It's just this big, fat, useless bird that stumbles around, that can barely walk, and you want to take on the the life of life force of that animal, then you are what you eat, right? And so, if you're going to eat animals, have ingest animals that will help enhance your health, health, and have things that have the chi or the power. I mean, I love elk. You know what I mean? I when it comes to wild game, I like things that are power animals that you know you you can pull out of nature without really disturbing it. And and that's a you know that's a tough subject all all in and of itself because you know how we feed ourselves can be an issue uh, kind of globally. But man, you got to eat wild things that have not been miserable, and yeah. you know chances are you'll be fine. <laughs> it it's really interesting. A lot of people assume that the tons and tons of meat and like tons and tons of fat is something that I, I would talk to and tons and tons of vegetables I talk to but man meat is the most dangerous food because it needs to come from healthy animals that were not mistreated and we can measure the hormones like there's a scientific side of this the cortisol and the stress hormones that are in those things have an effect on you when you eat them whereas if you eat an animal that led a good life that wasn't particularly miserable or sick and wasn't drugged and chemically treated and fed crap uh, th there's a difference. In your opinion, as both a meditation master and a doctor, is the difference energetic or is it hormonal or is it both? What's the difference? Yeah, both for sure. <laughs> it's both. All right. Yeah, cool. always. I mean, you know, the I think the mark of the West in how we look at things is we always try to segment things. It's like, well, is this spiritual or is this, you know, material? Is this energetic or is this hormonal? And and I think that one of the real kind of advancements we're making in the way thinking is happening now is realizing that there's an energetic signature, a quality of the energy curve to everything that happens, and then there's a reflection in the body. So if there is an energetic uh, state that is brought about by this animal, it'll also draw 
drive uh, certain ho- hormonal outcomes, uh, and you know, kind of as above, so below, as as you know, the the uh, ancients would say, um, because it's you know, you see it reflect on all levels, and even in the psyche. It it takes a certain amount of courage to say that, doesn't it? Because I mean, you know that right now, like there's a certain class of you know, skeptics who are like, ah, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about, because we haven't quantified that energetic signature yet. Do you think we'll be yeah. able to quantify it? Or do you think it's always going to be sort of subject to interpretation of the people who eat it, but know they felt good or didn't feel good? Well, I mean, you know, if you would have asked uh, my grandfather whether or not I could be sitting here staring at you having a conversation um, in, uh, you know, Victoria while in Southern California face to face, you know, uh, I think they would have thought that that was magical, mystical, right? I think that we're probably within 30 years of having a lot of of understanding and and being able to quantify those things. I'm not a chi apologist and I also don't, you know, basically send everything off into saying, well, that's mystical or that's God and so you can't touch it with your technology. Um, I I think we're close. And I think um, there's a lot of people out there that are already very uh, well um, established on that trajectory. You just won't hear about them in the popular media because um, it just doesn't fit the cabal, right? It just doesn't go with kind of the, the, the quote-unquote mainstream science that, you know, leads a lot of people down, you know, the, the drug route and, uh, you know, keeps people in the, in the hamster wheel there. And so I, I definitely have my opinions about how medicine works. I've been in it long enough. One of my big hopes is that the, the quantified self and, and big data in the cloud is just going to make it relatively simple. We have enough data from enough people we can crunch it and go, Oh, it looks like there's some definite patterns here that no one ever noticed before. And then you'll see some old monk in a cave. Oh, I noticed that 300 years ago or whatever, but uh, we're going to confirm and disprove a a set of, of things that different, uh, different teachers around the world or different traditions around the world have, have taught for a long time. Um, And, and into the day, it's all about observing and looking for patterns and then verifying them and making them repeatable. So, well, you, you talked about mass media, but you're a filmmaker, and I want to talk about your two films, uh, Origins and Vitality. And part of this is because I'm thinking about doing a film myself about uh, a subject that's that's near and dear to me, um, about you know the effect that mold has on the human body. So I'm not certain I'm going to even do that, but uh, that's kind of a sideline for my questioning. So if you hear me ask you a few weird things like that, it's because I'm thinking about something. Did you always want to be a filmmaker? I mean, I've never thought of making a film until recently, but you're doing this and you're doing some really good stuff. Why or why or when did you cut over to making films from you know, medicine and monking at the same time? If those are verbs. <laughs> <laughs> been monking for a while. Um, it's a great question, and, and the answer is I, I just stumbled into it um, because it became, you know, if if you lead your life in a way where you follow the the breadcrumbs that the universe lays out in front of you, um, some things just suddenly become self evident, and they are your next step, and you didn't expect it to come. And if you let your ego get in the way, you would kind of fall out of uh, the path of your destiny. And for me. I had a, a large successful medical group uh, in Los Angeles, California. You know, we're doing well, we're making a lot of money and all that. Um, and I was only getting paid when people were sick. And I was having a crisis of conscience thinking, thinking man, you know, Blue Cross only pays me for diagnosable illness. I'm in this game here where I, could, I have to wait till something breaks and then, you know, costs triple to fix it. I need to be on the front end of this. And then the more I started kind of getting into corporate consulting and lecturing and all the things that I started doing on the wellness side, the more I realized that the problem with the healthcare system is a lifestyle problem that needs to be solved outside of the healthcare system. And um, I'll tell you, one night, you know, my, my wife was on me for not hanging out, which means sit down and watch my TV show with me. And so, <laughs> so I pick up my laptop and I say, all right, sure. And I, you know, I kind of sit next to her with uh, my laptop. I'm kind of working away on my stuff because, you know, I'm a multitasker. And, and I counted nine pharma ads in a half hour chunk. I, I don't know what the purple pill is, by the way, but I really want to take one. I, just so we're clear on that. Well, yeah, you know, they've said it long <laughs> enough. Exactly. And, and you know, to me, I, I realized at that point that, it, you know, this is a battle for the minds of men, right? And it's a propaganda war and that the good guys are losing the propaganda war because the messaging is overwhelming. It's like a tsunami of messaging saying, you're not all right. The world's out to get you. You don't feel right. You need this. Go. Tell your doctor. Right. And, and it just got to the point where I said, you know what, I need to get into media 
because we're losing the game on this front and we really need to step out in front of this and get the messaging that people need to hear in front of them to help them, just literally liberate them from the matrix. You know what I mean? Wake them up so that they don't fall into the hamster wheel of this, you know, pill for an ill model. Now, how is that different than what supplement companies do? Uh, you know, you're not all right. You could have a risk of this. You could have a risk of that. Uh, how do you draw the line between a drug company and someone making herbal vitamin supplements? Uh, you know, it's a great question. It's a provocative one, um, which makes it a great question. Um, I think that there's been a lot of kind of nasty crossover um, by the supplement companies mimicking the uh, pharma business models and falling right into, uh, okay, well, a pill for an ill is now an herb for an ill, but it doesn't necessarily address the actual real politique of what lifestyle can do for you. It's about how you eat every day. It's about how you mm -hmm. sleep. It's how you, how you focus and keep your yeah. mind. And how you, just, just all of the things that we know better about, it's still this false promise, right? It's this get rich quick mentality for health. Right. It's like, don't worry about it. You know what? Go to the party. I got this great hangover herb. Right. Yeah. Just to kill yourself to tonight and you'll be fine. We got something for you. And so I think that that's, you know, I think it's a step in the right direction. And I think that certain market dynamics uh, made it easy for for supplement companies to fall into that modeling. Um, but it's also a, a very big trap because anything that's disempowering, anything that pulls your personal power out of the health equation, um, I think in, in the long run, is a trap. It it's a tough thing too because we have the whole the, the you can do better model, which is one that that I try to follow as a supplement manufacturer, uh, where you you have where you are, you can do better. And I've written articles like for Ask Men and Daily Beast about what does alcohol do to your body. Okay, I don't drink because it makes me weak. Like I just it's the the risk reward isn't there. Uh, but if someone is going to drink, and there's all kinds of people, even in paleo, oh, I drink red wine because somehow red wine has gotten a health glow, which I don't think it deserves. But uh, aside from that, okay, if it's going to happen and there's a supplement uh, or a lifestyle practice, either one that's going to make it better, it, it seems like people ought to know about it so you can make intelligent decisions. And I'm, I'm always asking myself, I don't want people to take my stuff or any other stuff that's not useful, that doesn't have an impact on them because we all have... You know, so much energy. We have so many pills we can take every day, even if you're, you're going to take hundreds of them. There's a limit. And like you want everything to count as much as possible. And I want everything that I do as a human being uh, to count as much as possible. You know, am I going to play mindfully with my kids or am I going to be distracted? It, it doesn't matter. Like, like that's my direction. What what about filmmaking? What helps you do the same thing, like to, to have the most bang for the buck there? Because, I mean, you can cure people as a doctor. You can, you know, write prescriptions, you can go into big companies, talk to CEOs, why film ahead of all those other priorities? Um, because it's a medium in which you can get in front of millions of people simultaneously and reproduce yourself and your message in a way, you know, if I want to work my tail off, I could see 30, 40 patients a day in a clinical setting and the world slides faster than I can fix. Right. And so it was about putting a loudspeaker on and then kind of locking arms with all, you know, all the luminaries we have on well.org and all the, you know, just all the wonderful, uh, you know, kind of messaging that I found is, you know, I, my motto is you put your camera on the good guys. And the second piece of that is we vote with our dollars. So if you could support people and products and companies that are doing the right thing, it, in effect, you're voting for a better world. You're helping make you know, yeah. this messaging get up there. And so to me, it was just a profound transition. And it's been a challenge kind of shooting my way out of clinical uh, practice because I really enjoy it. <clears throat> but, you know, there's just this this world is keeping me so busy that, um, you know, so, someone's got to do it. And there's plenty of great doctors that will kind of, you know, pick yeah. up the people that got shrapnel in them uh, from from, you know, eating the cocoa pebbles when they were kids. <laughs> it it's true that if you can amplify your message that you can do more um, to help lots and lots of people than you can to help the people who are in line outside your office. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that I I've work to grow the traffic on the Bulletproof site as well, because if I'm going to spend the time doing the research, I want more people to benefit from it. And if it doesn't work, they'll probably tell me it doesn't work right there in the comments. So let's zoom in on your two films because they're both different and they're both really cool. Let's talk about origins first and let's talk about vitality. So what's the deal with origins? Okay. So it's 
Well, you know what? I'm going to flip it on you because... Uh, you want to do Vitality first? Yeah, let me okay, do Vitality do first because Origins follows up uh, Vitality. Vitality started as an answer to this whole healthcare crisis because, you know, what these guys are bick bickering about in Washington isn't a healthcare debate. It's a healthcare finance debate. And who pays the extraordinary bills doesn't say anything about health. Right, it's all these middlemen trying to like game the system and figure out, you know, how to how to you know make money and stay in, stay in and all this. And so what we did is we did a top-down view of what vitality is, right? Because most people see health as no symptoms, right? Most people say, okay, well, I don't, I'm I'm not hurting, I'm not ailing, I'm I'm well, right? And then the healthcare system comes from everything below that to death you know, making trillions of dollars trying to fix things at, at triple the cost. But when we start talking about vitality, when we start talking about what's on the other side of this bar, what, what can be done to enhance, I mean, all the stuff you're doing with bulletproofing and upgrading and getting people to their peak potential, how can I enhance my body's energy output capacity? How can I enhance my body's functioning so that I can stave off disease easier? I could stay focused. I could stay calm. I could have more muscle mass. I could live a life filled with passion and adventure and meaning um, and not necessarily be cannon fodder for this nonsense that, that people are falling into. So it's, it's an inspirational movie to help people kind of look at health a little differently through like the four pillars of lifestyle basically diet exercise sleep and mindset and it's it's actually done really well it's you know the country of namibia is sharing it with every children every child in, in the country for uh you know like just teach them how to live uh and and be healthier i mean we have governors of a number of states that are in talks with us to get it to all their foster kids and wow it's, it's done yeah the ifm acam all the doctor groups love it so it's it's done really well uh in that capacity and the natural kind of progression from that was, okay, what, where would I take this next? And so we went to Africa. And so for origins, I mean, I went to the first caves that our ancestors stumbled out of hundreds of thousands of years ago after the last ice age and said, okay, what did food look like here? What was stress like here? How did we adapt? How did we rest? What did we do? And so here I am tracking lions and learning to coexist and survive on the land and wow. really just living like our, our ancestors did to, to really bring back the story of our origins and how far we've departed from that with our you know two-hour commutes and time with our cell phones on our laps and just all of the all of the barrage of chemical and electronic uh, pollution that has been challenging our systems that have adapted to life outside those caves, not necessarily Manhattan, right? And so yeah. it's, it's been a very powerful uh, process. I've gotten to interview the biggest names in health and wellness, and I've also got to travel the world and have a pretty cool life uh, making a movie. Now, that's, that's incredible because one of the arguments that I've made consistently around supplements is that it's totally okay to get all of your nutrition from food if you get all of your toxins and lifestyle stresses from mother nature, which no one does, right? So I, I'm just trying to keep my meat as fresh as I can. And in order to do that, when I do something unnatural to my meat, I try and do something else to counterbalance it. And I know that it's probably better to just be all natural, but it's not reasonable if you live in Manhattan. So, I mean, are you talking about countermeasures, like things you can do to hack, or are you mostly just kind of going back to what is nature and how far away from it are you? Well, yeah, you you know, once the car starts sliding, you you got the you got your hand on the wheel, and you're doing a lot of like you know course corrections uh, because you know there's not much I can do right now about you know trying to cross the road and having some diesel truck drive by and just gas me with a bunch of lead, right? Oops, I've been exposed, right? So you know the 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 basics are obvious, right? Eat natural, fresh, wild, organic food. Don't be an idiot. You know what I mean? Don't don't take chemicals and things that you know. And and what and a lot of that has to do with like fine Italian colognes. It has to do with cleaning products. It has to do with you know yeah. your your deodorant and all of these. Like nothing should be left off the table because your skin absorbs, mm -hmm. your nose absorbs. You know it's like anything that you're ingesting in any way is suspect. And so you know the first thing is always you know let's look let's line up the usual suspects and that's. 90% of it is you stop the bleeding, but then, you know, there's a lot of things you got to do to detoxify and, and to, um, you know, chelate, you know, the body has not adapted to a lot of these chemicals. So although it's very good at detoxifying itself with processes it's aware of, there's a lot of things that the body just doesn't know what to 
do with because it didn't exist in nature, right? And now we're in this, I think, this frontier land of having to count, make countermeasures against the measures we had that are not necessarily natural, but, you know, it's, it's you know, the, the, it's just the world we live in and the mess we've gotten into. And so we're trying to now find a way to use technology to save ourselves and save the planet. And really that's been a big piece of what I do is like, look, there's a million things that are going on right now with innovations in technology that can help make the world a better, cleaner, safer place. And uh, those are the things that I invest in. Those are the things that we you know, put our cameras on because you could either sit there and grumble about the world falling apart and like, you know, complain about Washington not being able to fix it or you just get up off your ass and start doing it. You know what I mean? You start working with people who are doing it and you just, you know, you become part of the good guy team. All right. Let's zoom in on that, Pedro, because, you know, be part of the good guy team. So what should people do, right? You're sitting at home, you've got a job, maybe a family. You know, you want to help, but you also want to pay the bills. And by the way, I get emails like this all the time from people who are like, you know, Dave, I, I, want to, I want to change the world and I have a crappy job and like the gap is so big. So, you know, it, it's easy for, for you and I to talk like that because we've both kind of made that transition, at least partially. Uh, I'm, I'm still working on it, I know, but um, in, mm -hmm. in, in order to making it, you know, a full time job. So what's your advice for people who want to make a transition like you did? Like God knows there's lots of doctors who would do what you did. Sure. Um, I would say that, and that's a great question because um, people who genuinely want to get out are stuck, right? And they can't find, you know, you, we've all got bills. We've got mouths to feed. You can't just leave and go, you know, join the Peace Corps. It doesn't work that way. Um, and it shouldn't work that way because that's an old model, right? And so my response to that always is your first goal, your first stop on that parade is always reestablishing your connection with your vitality, which means cleaning up the diet, yeah. getting your sleep, getting your life, <laughs> getting all of these departments, if you will, in a yeah. company sorted out because you have, you find the inefficiencies, you get more energy. It's like, it's like cash flow, right? You got more cash in your pocket, you got more options. And so as you start to eke out vitality out of all these lifestyle parameters, you start feeling better. And as you have this extra energy, then okay, then I'm going to devote two hours in the evenings to this special project. I'm a sales guy. So I'm going to triple my revenue this month and get myself out of this job. I mean, it, People always complain to me about not having enough time and my response always is, look, you don't, it's not time, it's vitality. If you had more energy, you would be able to do more and be more clear in the time that you're given and just be that much more efficient of a person throughout your day. Um, and most people are just exhausted uh, because they're, they got too much drag and they got too much inertia. So that's, that's always the first stop. And then, you know, along that path comes my favorite piece of it is, you know, the self-discovery. Because most of us in the West spend the majority of our time building these edifices around who we think we ought to be, um, who we need to present as a storefront to our, our neighbors, our friends. I mean, hell, you know, you're in high school and people are already asking you what you want to do for the rest of your life. You know, 17 years old, man, I was chasing girls. I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do for the rest of my <laughs> life. You know what I mean? I just, I, don't know, I just want to play basketball and, you know, go see a movie or, you know, whatever. Yeah. And so we have this, this, this culture of trying to establish who you are and make these proclamations before you can even figure out who you are. And by the time it's, you want to start figuring out who you are, you're already too busy pretending to be who you said you're going to be. And so, you know, once you kind of step back and start to figure out what it is specifically that makes you tick and talk and, and, and really where your personal passions lie. Then you take that extra vitality, you plug it into your newfound clarity and together you start moving. You don't start moving mountains at first. You start taking a, you know, a step at a time. But you know, I know a lot of people that have really transformed and jumped out of corporate America and you know, gotten out of whatever mess they were in um, by you know, doing it this way, right? We gotta eke out some life force first so that you have the energy to carry yourself into your, your dream. Because if not, it's just speculation. There's a lot of people talking about wanting to save the world. Um, and, you know, life isn't a spectator sport. So you got to you got to be a, a participant in it uh, in every way. And so if you're, you know, trying to do everything right, but that 10 percent you're not doing, um, that might be the the unlock to where you're you're still stuck and where you're not getting enough energy uh, reserves out to be able to kind of push yourself to the next level. So increase your energy first, 
and then use the energy to get yourself unstuck. This is basically what you're saying. Yeah, and then and then the third step to that, which is I think one of the most primal kind of uh, first level spiritual lessons, is allow the universe to work through you, right? Whether you're you know a religious person or a mystical person or whatever, Un, you know, devote your life to something way bigger than yourself, and just be of service to, to whatever it is that you've devoted that cause, whatever it is. And then just watch how the breadcrumbs show up. Watch how miraculous life will be once you are doing something that's not your own dumb ego play, right? Where it's about helping people doing the, doing a bigger play. Uh, my experience has been that, uh, when I'm authentically working to help other people that serendipity sure does happen in a non serendipitous way. Like, good stuff happens that makes important things happen. And I don't know why I don't have to exactly know why I've just noticed it. And there is a question in my mind, like, was that really random? And I'm not going to say if the, the good things that happen are or are not random, because I just don't know. But I can tell you that, you know, I'm happier and I get more stuff done when I'm looking out, you know, I, I'm really working to help a lot of other people. And I find that when I talk with people who are, you know, on a spiritual path, and have had some progress and some achievement, people like you, it's almost universal. Like they'll tell you like really kind of crazy good stuff happens to me and I don't know why. Um, but when I'm, you know, when I'm doing the right thing, obstacles get out of my way. Um, is it repeatable for everyone? I have no idea, but it sure seems to work for me and my life is different since I started looking at it that way. So you had the same yeah. experience. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the scientist in me has seen enough proof to say, hey, this keeps happening. And if you look at kind of like the champions of our economy, you look at like read Napoleon Hill and all these guys, and he was falling around the Carnegies and falling around all these like, you know, these ballers, right? And, and watching what they did, they all thought this way. They all kind of committed to visualizing and seeing and kind of, you know, being part of bigger projects. Some of them might have gone, you know, awry or any of this kind of stuff, um, you know, as, as is uh, often happens with people who don't remember to keep chiseling away at the ego, right? But for the most part, if you can be of service and have the power behind you and the clarity behind you to keep kind of walking that path, um, it's like, you know, you're like a hot knife through butter, man. Like, like just the universe yeah. kind of just like melts around you and you just keep cruising and, and everyone goes, wow, that guy's really blessed. But what he's really doing is, you know, he's just, you know, part of the formula, right? And, and I've seen it time and time again. It it sure seems to work. Uh, sure seems to work like that. And and this gets into the kind of the mushy part of uh, of the bulletproof executive radio show, where I don't know what the heck is going on with all this stuff, uh, to be honest. But there's a reason you should meditate, and it has to do with internal calmness. And maybe it's just that when people are calm or on a mission or something, that they just get more done. Um, there's a lot of things that we may never figure out about all that, but there's something to it. And Pedram, you've you just reference it directly. You're not exactly a slouch from a Western perspective. You studied medicine and you've studied uh, monkery, which is a word that I have to put in the dictionary if it's not already there, because <laughs> that's just awesome. <laughs> Monking, monkery, whatever it is, it's cool. And uh, uh, and so it it's just comes down to that. Even when you talk with guys like Mark Devine, who was on the show earlier from Seal Fit, you know, wow, you'll hear similar stuff coming from Mark, you know, Navy Seal commander guy. And wow, why is it in common across all these people? Do you touch any of that in origins or vitality? Or is this just more of like we're kind of going off on a personal tangent? No, origin starts to go there. Vitality, yeah. I kind of kept, uh, kept the, pulled my punches a little bit because, again, we're going to really kind of mass audience trying to wake up the, uh, you know, wake up the zombified masses and help people who are awake use this as a tool or a frame of reference uh, in how to have this discussion for with the 10, 20 people in their lives that just need to listen. Um, so it's, you know, a lot of doctors use it as a tool just to wake up their patients a little bit. But in origins, we start going there. And, you know, I'm not an apologist. I will, you know, I'll, I'll tell it like it is. I don't care if people don't agree with me. I don't need them to, right? I'm you know, just another <laughs> yeah. guy talking, right? I've hung out with you at Denver enough times. But yeah, you're, you're willing to just say it like it is. <laughs> All right. So speaking of hanging out at dinner, uh, we talked a little bit earlier about kind of, you know, nutrition and all you're mostly vegetarian. Any, any tips? I mean, you've, you've done a movie on eating for energy as well as the other practices for energy. So like, what are some nutritional tips that you, you would have for people? Look, you know, 
I think that a lot of what you say and do um, really works well in the mornings. Um, I like high fat. I'll do I'll do a bulletproof coffee. Oh, You're, you do? Okay. I wasn't. I know I've given you beans, but I don't know if you actually use them. Yeah, right, cool. I, I'll do a bulletproof coffee. I'll put in a couple scoops of my protein shake in there. I got enough okay. protein and protein and fat in the morning, and I'm good, and I'm going all day. Uh, you know, if you're gonna have carbs, have have them after a workout. Right. Um, I like to have protein right before, uh, you know, dinner for people who are not like you know, some chicken and some olive oil or whatever it is just before sleep so that um, it can help kind of keep you if, if you're having blood sugar issues at night. But really, you know, for me, it's about things that you would find in the natural environment and 80 percent of the fruits and vegetables. And I'm being very uh, generous about this, but uh, probably much more than 80 percent. But 80 percent of the fruits and vegetables you're going to find out there did not exist during Paleolithic <laughs> times, right? These, it's, all, it's all been adapted, it's all been modified to kind of enhance the sugar volume over tens of thousands of years because we like sugar and it's awesome, right? But if you're, you know, it's, it's hard with some of these paleo arguments to, to make a, an apples to apples comparison because apples used to look like these little like, you know, crapples right yeah and it was just you it didn't even look like it but you you know, have to work and get through a bunch of fiber and like a tough skin to get some like you know some water and some some you know sugar and it was a treat so you know the nature of all the food that we're eating even has changed to such a dramatic degree that you know the closer you could get to you know your own garden great uh, you know, wild harvesting food is really hard to do, especially when we're talking about like vegetables and stuff. I mean, if everyone started doing that, we'd have some trouble. Yeah, it's, we'd have no more wild, right? Yeah, there'd be no more wild. I mean, we're already threatening it. If we didn't have like, you know, national parks, I think it'd already be over. And so, you know, there's there's definitely some kind of like societal considerations with that. But I mean, man, the closer to nature, the better. That's always been my thing. As a Taoist, all we do is hang with nature. And, you know, the more you can eat natural stuff, the closer you're going to be to nature. And the closer you are to nature, the further you've gone uh, from your origins. And you are, you're, you're in the flow. Do you have your own garden? Yeah, actually, we just uh, we just bought this house, and um, there's a good bunch of guys doing landscaping right out there. <laughs> cool. I'm working out of the house today, and there's a whole area cordoned off over there for our uh, new garden here. Beautiful. Yeah. So you do kind of practice what you preach. Oh yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. You can't. I mean, you know, when people aren't, you know, if you have a four hundred pound cardiologist telling you you need to exercise, <laughs> run, right? Because that's just they're not they're not in sync with what's up. Yeah. All right. I, I know people who've said you know, never trust a a fat nutritionist. <laughs> do you ascribe to that philosophy? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, if you're <laughs> You know, and, and the problem is never go to a crazy psychologist either. You know, good luck with that. <laughs> you know, it's hard. It's hard. There's a lot. I think a lot of people go into psychology because they're trying to sort themselves out. Sure. And, and then, you know, they get in there and they're kind of extrapolating things based on their own limited worldview and their own pain points. And so it's, you know, we live in this culture where we are constantly trying to give people our power and say, tell me what to do. And, you know, part of my central message and, and, and a lot of the stuff that, that, that I do and I know you do is trying to empower people to wake up to their own potential, right? Wake up to their own kind of inner truth and, and learn from the wise, but then really look at how that applies in their own life and, and really step into their own ability to make better rational decisions and make better food decisions and all of it because, you know, at the end of the day, you don't want people walking around like zombies. You know, we're in the business of waking up the zombies. Yeah. And I have a really personal mission there. I have kids, right? They're young. Like I, I want there to be less zombies because I want to live in the world with them. And, and so there's a lot of people who are listening to this now, um, probably 50 or so thousand people um, the first week. And I don't think many of them are zombies, but every time one of them does what you just recommended about, you know, having more energy or making a decision to, to do things that are, are good for those around them, like other people will start to pay attention. And same thing, they watch one of your films, they watch Origins, they watch Vitality, and like, wait, I can do this and I can share it. And it becomes relatively simple just to lead by example. You're like, okay, I'm not eating the junk food at the restaurant, I'm just going to have the salad because there was nothing else on the menu I wanted. People will notice, especially if you lost 100 pounds along the process, and maybe they'll lose 100 pounds. And, you know, it's just kind of the way to be from, from a rational perspective, at least from where I said. And I, I think you'd share that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, the thing is, um, 
there's this tendency for people who kind of are in the know to be like, oh, I already know that. But, you know, a lot of that, a lot of our messaging towards people who are smart and already awake isn't to say, you know, hey, dummy, I'm trying to talk lower than you. I'm trying, we're, what we do is we create messaging that they can use for the people that are asleep in their lives, right? Sure. I love high level conversation, but there's like four people to talk to. At that, at that, you know what I mean? Like yeah. it's just there's such a, a you know, the, the, the people that are already having this dialogue aren't the people that are the problem. These are the upper echelons that are already trying to like, you know, step to that next level. But they, you know, whether it's employees, family members, friends, whatever, in their own universes that are still struggling, what we're trying to do is give the the world's leaders more tools to help wake up the the unenlightened masses all around them so that all together everyone could lift, right? I, I like that, and filmmaking is is an important part of it. I, I got back from South by Southwest earlier this week, and there were so many people making films. I realize it's it seems, at least not having done it, at least as hard as writing a book. And you've written a book, and you've made some films. Which one's harder? Huh. You know, um, it's hard to say because my first book, I sat on my ass a lot. And so I got up with back pain and I realized never, never again, my next book I'm going to write dictating while hiking. Um, but yeah. I, would say, <laughs> I would say making movies uh, is considerably harder because the way we make them is I go capture genius um, and then have it fit into an argument. And sometimes the movie makes itself and sometimes you could say just the right thing but it's not delivered in the right way. And I'm not dealing with actors. I'm dealing with like thought leaders. I'm dealing with people who are, are really moving the needle. So – it's hard to not get lectured. One of the hardest things about making Vitality, and we're, we're editing Origins right now, and it's, you know, it's, it's a challenge. It always is. I, I can't wait hardest... to see Origins. I'm, I'm really excited about that, partly because I might be in it. So. That's right. That's right. No, you're, I'm stoked because you, you, there's actually some things that um, you know, we'll talk about that like, is, you have a unique contribution to the world, and I'm very excited for you to kind of have a, have a spotlight in that movie uh, saying those things. But the whole point is you, got, you, know, you have all of these, like some of the smartest pieces of vitality that I could geek out over like, you know, and just be like, wow, that was really genius. That really kind of stoked my, my doctor brain. Is it's not appropriate for a kind of a mass level movie. So we had to kind of create an offline like mastery DVD of Vitality to be like, here's some nuggets of like the super smart stuff, but here's the stuff that's going to craft an argument for the masses to kind of wake up. So there's a lot of layers of thought that go into making a movie because it also has to be entertaining, it has to be funny, it has to be punchy, it has to be visually stunning. Um, and and yeah, it's just it's a symphony. Um, and there's a lot of pieces that go into it. And so uh, I, I welcome the challenge. I'm a martial artist, you know what I mean? I don't anticipate a jab or a cross. I'm just ready. <laughs> and whatever right. comes, comes, right? That's awesome. And speaking of whatever coming, coming, uh, we are just about up to the end of the show. And that means my favorite question of the show is coming as well. So put on your Shaolin hat, Pedro. <laughs> Top three recommendations for people who want to kick more ass. So people want to perform better at all walks of life. And this isn't just from your doctoring or your monking or anything else you've done. Uh, just, you know, your entire life's experience, three pieces of advice for people listening at various levels of expertise uh, about what they can do to just perform better. Yep. Um, first and foremost, I say right upon waking, get up, take at least 20 deep breaths to your lower abdomen, and then visualize your day and how you want it to go. And really drop into your lower abdomen and, and see your day the way you want it to go. Be a master of your circumstances and don't be the driftwood tumbling around on the beach of life. First and foremost. Second, raw substrate. Get up, get fueled, and get going. And really stay uh, charged for what it is that you've, you've kind of visualized throughout the day so you can manifest things. There's a lot of stuff that will come in and distract you. And then to bookend it on the other side, there's a million things I could say, but to bookend it on the other side is really start turning things down after 6 or 7 p.m. Start turning down the lights, start getting away from the blue lights and the, 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 <laughs> you know, the, the cameras and the, the TVs and all the stuff. And I mean, for some nights we'll go by candlelight. Start toning down as the cavemen would and have some darkness and silence in your life and you'll find you get better sleep and you'll have more chi and mojo getting into your next day so you can really thrive uh, into the next cycle as you bring this one to an end on a daily basis. Beautiful. It seems like you've got the circadian hacking down pretty well. So 
start it out and close it down. That, that's that's a, a very orchestrated answer pattern. Did you prepare it ahead of time? I had no idea. Like I said, <laughs> awesome. Like I no, said, that... I wasn't anticipating a jab. I'm just well, hanging on. <laughs> no, no, that, that was really cool. I, I, I don't know anyone in the 100, 100 and, I don't know, 110 or so podcasts so far who, who made all three of them stack up like that. So very elegant, my, uh, my Shaolin friend. <laughs> so I can't wait to uh, hang out the next time we get to hang out. Thanks a ton for being on the show. And for people who are listening, there will be links to Vitality org well.org is it vitality.org do i have that right nope. no well.org oh. is where most of our stuff hangs out and okay. now we have our we have our be more magazine which you can find in the newsstand which is awesome and you're part of that and um sarah dr sarah godfrey and i are also doing the health bridge which is a podcast now we get to hang out and we'd love to have you on it and oh, yeah. just 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 out there doing our thing and uh having some fun doing it but well.org is is probably the, the the easiest hub to find me and that's that's where i hang out lovely Awesome. Well, talk to you soon. Thanks. Thank you. Check out the Bulletproof whole body vibration platform called the Bulletproof Vibe on UpgradedSelf.com. And it is one of the biohacks that has made a huge difference for my energy levels, my well-being, and for maintaining myself in the state of Bulletproof high performance. See the head of foam that's formed on it? This is similar to what you get with a latte. They're actually little bubbles still coming to the surface, just like a freshly steamed latte, but the flavor is something that you wouldn't expect. It is creamier and more delicious than a latte ever has a chance of being.